Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming along to tonight's event by Professor Mohammed Sedki. Just a few housekeeping rules from me. Um, there's no fire drill tonight, so if you do hear the fire alarm, the doors are located at the back of the room and to your left. If you do have mobile phones, if you could kindly switch them off or pop them onto silent. To introduce the event, I'd like to welcome to the stage Professor Al Hajj Be apologies, Ben Kalefa, Director of Smart Systems, AI and Cybersecurity Research Centre. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming, friends, family, and uh, members of the community. It's my pleasure to, um, an honor to actually introduce my uh, colleague and friend, Mohammed Sidki, for his inaugural professorial lecture. Uh, I have known Mohammed Sidki for the past 13 years since he joined the university. So he came all the way from Alexandria, Egypt, 20 years ago, 2003, um, as a research assistant and a part time lecturer at the university here. Uh, where he got his, getting his PhD in um, uh, the application of physics-based image uh, formations model to change detection in the context of workplace video surveillance. Um, the PhD was a starting point of um, um, a rich career for Mohammed. Um, he uh, patented as part of his PhD um, project. He, he created a patent uh, called Spectral 360, uh, which was um, actually ranked the first in the world. Uh, for the um, uh, two years in a row, 2013, 2014. Um, on the back of the um, patents, not everyone, by the way, in, from, uh, created patents for the PhD and a spin out, very, very, very few people. So on the back of the, uh, the patent, Mohammed has created um, a spin out company, AVA Technologies Limited, where he was a CTO, and the company has been running for 10 years, um, from 2011, 2020, and it's been one of our success stories for the university that covers different areas of video surveillance or video analytics from detection to um, um, classifications to other, other areas. Uh, Mohammed has led or been involved in a number of um, international projects uh, of multi-million um, uh, euros involving multi-partners from different countries in the world. And his research, uh, main focus in research is around um, biologically inspired computational models for machine learning, targeting, cybersecurity applications, and developing physics-based computer vision technologies. Um, he was um, a core member of the past um, REF submissions, REF 2020, 2014, and then 2021. Um, and um, he supervised many PhD students, um, around seven uh, in completion, and currently supervising 11 uh, more PhD projects. Um, and he did uh, supervise many master dissertations and um, close to 100 kind of final year projects. I think, uh, Mohammed, I think in, 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 um, uh, in addition to the research and teaching impact that he's um, shown in his uh, career, he's shown a lot of impact as well for the, uh, for the community. He's been involved in a number of humanitarian um, um, activities. He is currently the vice president of um, uh, Stafford Welcome Refugees. He's also the uh, member of the Standard Advisory Council for Religious Education, and he's a member of the UNESCO group teaching AI from, um, from home um, uh, 4K12. Um, it's been a pleasure, as I mentioned, working with um, Mohammed um, for the past 13 years. In fact, he was one of the first people I met when I joined the university. And um, as researchers, we always have our ups and downs. Uh, Mohammed, when you talk to him, is always very enthusiastic and very actually passionate about his research. Uh, for those who are um, um, uh, 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 follow the media and concerns, uh, have concerns about the AI taking over our humankind, probably you come to the right place. So Mohammed probably uh, will, will, will touch on that and whether AI will actually take over or will be still under the human control. So uh, I welcome you all to the inaugural lecture, professorial lecture titled AI Phobia, how to live peacefully with intelligent machines. Mohammed. Thanks, al Hajj, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Really, thanks for the colleagues, uh, friends, brothers, and the people who have been working for years and years. Uh, so today, I want to really to take you through the journey I went through, and the journey started from uh, Alexandria. And this was the first scene uh, from Egypt. And uh, actually, what happened is, uh, the day 
uh, where my mom and my dad and my auntie and my, the hus my auntie's husband, they were playing cards at home. And then my mom said that she's not feeling well. And then my aunt told her, actually, you are, you, are, you are just excused because you are not, uh, you are because you are losing in a way. So she said, no, I'm not feeling well. Uh, and then the rang the doctor, and she said, actually, it is a time to give birth. And uh, I'm going to finish my cigarette, and then the baby will be with us. And this was it. And this was the 26th of March, 1974, uh, uh, at home, which is, wasn't uh, usual, by the way. Norm, all my, my sister and brother, they uh, have been giving birth in, at hospitals. And then I started the journey, really, and uh, joined a French uh, school uh, in Alexandria, Lycée de Liberté. Uh, and after year uh, uh, nine, I moved to another school. And then I joined uh, the Faculty of Engineering, which is Alexandria University. And actually, my passion wasn't to join Faculty of Engineering. My passion was to join the Egyptian Marine, uh, to follow the footsteps of my dad as Admiral in the Egyptian Navy. And this was my passion all the time, until it came to the point at uh, year uh, 10, where I got a full mark in math. Uh, and then uh, in year 11, when I got full marks in three parts of the math, and I lost only one mark and a half in the other two parts. So it was clear that kind of my abilities is actually taking me to engineering. So I joined Faculty of Engineering uh, with, uh, again, during my studies, I used to have the habit of helping my colleagues and actually teaching them. So, uh, and I wasn't really, again, planning to go through the teaching career or universities or anything like this. But I found out through the years that actually kind of uh, I can do something I, I like and something really I have passion for. And uh, I kept doing it until I came to a point after graduation, while I was waiting for my military service. I joined a company, a computer and networking company in Alexandria. And this company was responsible for what we call it help desk for the WHO, World Health Organization, which is used to be hosted in Alexandria. Moved again, moved 15 years ago or more to Cairo, but at that time it used to be in Alexandria. So I, I, for these three months, while waiting for my military service, I have been working in the, inside the WHO as network engineer. And this gave me kind of some experience about computer networks and the building computers and the like. And one day during these three months, one of my friends, actually older than me, the Actually, uh, I met him, and he told Muhammad, we have a friend. Uh, his dad got a business, and he wants to install a computer network. Can you do it for us? So I told him, yes, of course I can do it for you. So we went, myself, my friend, another friend, together, and we started installing the computer network, and we finished it in, one, in two days. And then we got 75 Egyptian pounds. At this time, my salary was 200 pounds per month. So we got 75 Egyptian pounds, and then at the night went to get our dinner, so we decided to put another 25 pounds on top of the 75 to get 100 and start a company. And this was my first company in 1996, two months after graduation. This was SKM Communication Systems. And it was mainly for uh, uh, computer networks and PBX, private branch exchanges, small telephony systems for hotels and, uh, uh, and actually businesses and sometimes for, for homes as well. So we started the company, myself as a full-time, and my other partners as part-time, because one of them was working for Siemens and the other one was working for another company. And the same year, and actually I got exempted from my military service, and the same year, October 1996, I joined a university, Arab Academy for Science and Technology, which is under the, Arab, the umbrella of the Arab League. It's not an Egyptian university as such, but kind of under the Arab League. So I joined this one as a teacher or a lecture assistant. And as a part-time lecture assistant, at the same time, I was full-time in my company. After a year, I got full-time position in Arab Academy of Science and Technology, and both my partners, I left the company, sorry, they left their companies, and they, they worked for full-time in our company, SKM. So I was part-time in my company, full-time in the university, and my partners, they were full-time in the company itself. And we started. And the, the company actually was doing very well. At this time, cyber cafes and so on used to be, again, a fashion. So we started one of them as well. So uh, at a certain point of time, I used to work in the morning at the university, afternoon at the company, night time, cyber cafe, and then turn back one o'clock in the morning or so, and then back again to the university in the morning. And 
it was really fun at this time. Business with teaching and uh, lots of activities and knowing lots of people, and it was really a uh, very good experience to me. So this was since uh, I, uh, I have been in Alexandria, and in 2003, uh, my best friend, really, Sharif Nuruddin, which I was in contact with him and I've worked with him in Arab Academy for Science Technology for six, seven years. So he came in 2000 here in the UK, Staffordshire University, to do his PhD with Professor Mansour Muniri at this time, uh, was head of research and our supervisor. And he told Muhammad, we, we got a, a, a scholarship for you if you wanted to, or at least I can commend you in a way. So he commended me. And uh, I got, I, I contacted Professor Mansour, I got the interview. At the same time, I got a full scholarship from George Mason University from the States. But again, because of a number of reasons, I decided to go to England instead of going to the States. And I joined Professor Mouniri's uh, research group at this time in 2003. And uh, this was the start of my PhD. So this is Sharif Nouruddin in front of Stafford Castle in 2003, when we, uh, we started actually the journey together here. Until now, Sharif is actually much, much more than a friend. Um, the, I just something really important to, uh, to mention. SKM, uh, my company, was really not only a business for me, but it was actually something much more than that, because I met my beloved wife in the company. So Angie, my wife, she actually joined the company as trainee at this time. And we decided to get married, and this happened in 2002. Uh, so we got engaged from 1998 till 2002. So don't get me wrong, it took time, but this is me anyway. Everything takes time. So, but actually, I, uh, Angie for me again, she, uh, she's my friend, my wife, and everything uh, to me. So we started, uh, we came together, we actually got married in 2002. And Hamid, my, my elder son, actually was uh, uh, born in, uh, in 2002, November 2002, and we came to the UK here in March 2003, while Hamid was three months old. I started my PhD, and in the first meetings with my supervisor, uh, Mansour Muniri, he told me, actually, Mohammed, I read your CV, and I can see that you are really practical and you like to do, uh, uh, you know, you turn your, your research into uh, into the kind of products and the like, because actually my master's degree, which I forgot to mention, in the Arab Academy of Science Technology, this has been actually converted to a product. So I, then I told him, okay, that's fine. So what, what is your plan? So he told me, actually, we want to do something which could be commercialized. But this is going to cause a risk, because for a PhD, you need to prove that there is a contribution to knowledge. So I told him I'm going to take the, the risk. I'm going to do my best to present something which is hopefully could be commercialized and for sure to present a contribution to knowledge. And he told me if we got product out of it, but no contribution to knowledge, there is no PhD. I told him actually I'm going to make my, my best to achieve the contribution to knowledge. Normally, by the way, as Professor Hajj was mentioning, normally to get a product out of a PhD, normally you need three, four PhDs, so 12 years or more. So I started my PhD by uh, investigating the application of, or the commercial application of video surveillance systems and the, the application of computer vision in video application systems. And at this time, the term video analytic was not familiar. Actually, this term started in 2007 in the industry. So we started investigating this one, and we published our first paper, and then we started actually developing algorithms, and we found that the main problem which hinder this application is the case that the, what we call is the first building block, which is what we call a change detection. So we started by looking for developing automated algorithms, which you can look to the video streams and then detect movements and detect activities, and then help the operators, the video surveillance operators, to alert them about these movements. And then based on that, instead of them watching multiple screens, each screen divided into multiple videos, for them just to be alerted on the main activities. And actually our aim at this time was to augment, to help those operators. But what is going nowadays is actually deviated a lot from what we have been planning for. As you, you know nowadays, AI and the government announcement just two weeks ago. So the AI actually is really replacing lots of jobs nowadays. But our aim at this time was mainly to help the operator not to really take this responsibility from them. 
So we started by developing algorithms uh, to detect moving objects, then to classify them, and then to track them, and then to detect their behaviors, and then to alert those users. So what happened is that after trying a number of different ways of doing so, we found that there are still major issues which causes, uh, or these, these issues cause uh, unacceptable false alarm rate. And these issues are mainly related to scene structures, different scene structures, and different illumination conditions. And right now, these are the same issues which face any computer vision system. So I started looking to solve the problem in a different way. So I looked to something called image formation models. And these image formation models have been used for uh, uh, color reproduction. So it has been used for, uh, in the industry for a number of years to get an image and which is scanned, for example, or uh, get an image from a camera, and they try to print this image in the original condition. So they try to estimate the illumination condition, and then they try to estimate some parameters from the image, and when they print it, they try to print it in a way similar to the original condition again. The problem with these techniques, they were used for offline application, not for real-time application. Hence, I, my, I got the aim to make use of these models to, make, to use them for video analytics solution for real-time application. And this is what I have managed to do. And based on that, I came up with a technique called Spectral 360, which means full spectrum from our point of view. Full spectrum, which is actually a technique which can get the red, green, and blue, red, uh, green, and blue output of the camera, RGB output of the camera, and uh, estimate the illumination condition, like in film studios, and, but, but using a software, and then after that, to uh, reconstruct what we call it surface spectral reflectance, which is a unique signature of the material itself. And based on that, we have managed to do two things. We have managed to, first of all, to detect the illumination condition and the changes in the condition quickly. Actually, every frame we can detect whether the illumination changed or not, so we don't have to wait for the system to, uh, to fail until we, and, until we react in a way. And the other thing, we managed to get to a signature for the material. So whenever we want to compare between foreground and background or two different materials, then we can compare with much more higher accuracy. So this surface spectral reflectance is actually a conversion from three values, red, green, and blue, into full spectrum, from 400, 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer, which is a visual uh, range. So uh, the models actually, as you can see from this one, the models actually includes the uh, image formation models, which includes the physics behind the creation of an image inside the camera. So it takes into consideration the illuminant, source of illumination, and the surface spectral reflectance of the material, and the sensor of the camera itself. Doing modeling for all three of them, and then using our software to detect the illumination condition and to detect the surface spectral reflectance. And we ended up having a breakthrough in terms of technology in real time, allowing us to measure better uh, accuracy for the actual color itself and estimating the illumination condition as well. And based on that, we come up with, as you can see here, actually to the, to the left is for others, and to the right is Spectral C60, our technology. The illumination is going to change now, and the majority of other systems are going to detect this change as a change, and, and we will we'll keep this change. So any, as you can see, this blue circle, this means that there is a change, and the change is still there. And in reality, the change was only a shadow. And our system managed to detect that it was just elimination condition change. And then, as you can see, the left one, they are actually not, they are missing detection of those people now and still struggling to find out that this was just a shadow. Our system managed to detect directly what was going on and detecting the object directly. You might say that this is just a few seconds and a few minutes, but in reality, these applications are for critical application, critical infrastructure protection and the like. And actually, the requirements you detect in few seconds, actually less than five seconds, the appearance of any object, for example, in most of these cases. So actually, any of these false alarms or misdetection, they cause a failure for the system itself. So this is actually to give you an indication what we have been doing. So I, I, I used to take a frame by frame. For each frame, I used to detect the highlights from this frame. And from these highlights, which is the, the image to the uh, right, you will find from these highlights, we can apply our models to detect the illumination condition itself. And here, for example, the CCT is called colorated color temperature, 
which is a value very similar to film studios when they measure the uh, uh, illumination condition. They measure it in, in Kelvin using this correlated current temperature. And actually, this is the value, the measured one is, for example, 4,827 Kelvin, and our software is detecting it as 5,000 Kelvin, which is not far away. So based on that, we estimate the illumination for each frame. And once we have done so, this is for another image for outdoor. So this is an outdoor image, and the other one was indoor. And after that, use this uh, illumination uh, estimation module or, and to uh, reconstruct the surface spectral reflectance. So what you can see, this cross here is actually a cross on one pixel. And every pixel could be represented as full spectrum, hence the name spectral 360. So the full spectrum, which is the one, which is the red one, is one measured by spectrometer. And the blue one, the one which is, I have estimated using my software. And you can see that they are not far away again in terms of estimating this full spectrum. Yeah. So, and this is another example from outdoor one. The first application was what we call a change detection, trying to segment moving object from, or objects from the background. And we managed to achieve very high results or very good accuracy. And we managed to apply for, uh, actually it was a competition called changedetection.net, where more than 25 universities and companies have been competing, and we managed to get the best results out of them for two years in a row. And the competition included 34 videos, different videos. This is one of them called Camera Jitter. And the highlight means this is the actual moving object apart from separating it from the movement of the camera itself, which is a shaking camera, as you can see. And some of this, actually, this is a very bad quality video from police forces. And you can see the moving object is very similar to the background, but the software and actually police forces, police investigators, they have to check these movements and they have to check actually 24 hours worth of video, maybe could be a month worth of video, and they try to just uh, uh, store whenever or stop and record whenever movement like this one. And you can see this is actually a very tough, even for human operator to detect, but we automated using our Spectra C60. So we started actually getting some momentum here, and we, the, the university started by putting some money and we got a business plan from an independent company, patent landscaping and market assessment. And the university was convinced that there is a market opportunity for us. So we started by filing three patents, US one and EU one and UK one. And we got, uh, the, got them granted. And then we started going to exhibitions. So we went to EFSEC, which is the, one of the main exhibitions for security solutions in Birmingham International, uh, NEC. And as you can see, it was actually the first day I went there, I still remember myself and uh, Professor Abdul Hamid Suleiman, and uh, at this time, uh, Professor Mohammed Abdul Mgid, if you, of course, I'm, I'm sure lots of the audience here remember him. When I went there, I went, I found Siemens and Honeywell and uh, giants. And I was actually there as a university project still starting. I was really scared, in a way, what we're gonna do. When people there, they are actually putting everything, you know, uh, uh, lightings and stuff, everything is uh, singing and dancing. And then once the, the exhibition started, I was surprised. Actually, the, 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 what you can see now was, was actually the norm, by the way. We found lots of people there looking to our algorithms, lots of interest. We captured 200, I remember 220 plus interest in our solutions just from three days. And again, interviews and uh, Professor Claude Chibalushi was my second supervisor which is actually uh, was, again, for me, was a role model. Uh, I learned a lot from him. Uh, and of course, Professor Mansour Muniri, which is my, my principal supervisor, all what I'm doing now as, as a researcher, as a supervisor, as a mentor, all of them I have learned from uh, Professor Mansour Muniri. So I cannot really, the words not enough to explain and, and to describe what Professor Mansour Muniri means to me. And as the same for Mohammed Abdul Megid, which again was actually very, very useful in lots of, and every time actually still right now, uh, a, a very, very good friend. And uh, I got advice from him for lots, lots of stuff. Then after this interest, the university decided to go for a company, spin-off company, AVA, or Adaptive Video Analytics Technologies. And we started the company in 2010, and we had four products, AVA Protect, AVA Detect, Count, and Analyze. Uh, Analyze was actually a, a solution to the police forces here in the UK, where we do what we call it post-incident analysis for video, for video forensic. 
And our account was mainly for traffic management, counting pedestrians and, and vehicles. And our the detect was mainly for uh, critical infrastructure protection. And our protect was, was was again for mainly for more critical application like for uh, uh, MOD, Ministry of Defense, and the like. And we had a number of customers, including uh, Defense and Science Technology Laboratory, and including uh, uh, Transport for London, and uh, Staffordshire Police, Leicestershire Police, Circo, and so on. This is actually to represent our uh, video forensic solution to police forces, where we used to get the videos from the digital video recorder or network video recorder. And then we, from this video management software itself, we get the video feeds, and then we apply our technology, which is change detection itself, tracking, and then event detection. And finally, we do the analytics on top of them. And then based on that, we generate a, a report. And this report it goes to the viewer, which is another piece of software we developed in the company itself, which allows the video uh, or the police investigator to sit, and instead of watching 24 hours worth of video for again a month or two months or three months, they just, just can watch just the events, the key events which they have described at the beginning. And this is actually an example again of these interfaces of two software. The, the one below is the actual analytics itself, which generates the events, and the top one is the viewer, which you can load two different cameras and the events, and based on that, the investigators they, they can just select the event, and if they found this event, they can jump directly to the event. So the list, you can see it here actually, worth, every one of them was 10 hours or depends on how the file is stored, sometimes three, four hours, sometimes up to 10 hours uh, of video, but they don't have to watch any of these. They can just jump directly to the second menu, which is the events, and they can see the start time of the event, end time of the event. They can watch this event if it is of interest. They can just click the radio button, and at the end they can uh, record all uh, uh, events of interest. And has been used with Staffordshire Police, has been actually used by uh, or introduced to the court of law as the first video analytic output to be to produced to the court of law here in the UK. And after that, we managed to win a competition, which is an MOD competition. And this competition called Sapient for critical infrastructure. And, uh, and then what will happen, actually, we built uh, these technologies. This is fixed camera to the left. Top right, you will find a tilt zoom camera. The, the camera to the left is actually detecting moving object, detecting how far the object is from the camera, ground distance, detect the speed of the, the, the vehicle itself, and it actually gives the uh, geolocation as well, longitude and latitude. And the camera to the right, which is the pan zoom camera, as you can see, it is focusing now on the far away object, which we cannot see ourselves from the fixed camera because this is instructed directly from the analytics software, the pan zoom camera. And to, down you'll find the Google map, and this is another technology we patent as well, which allows us to get the geolocation of the object and put it on a Google map from the camera itself using this camera calibration technique. We applied it again for other uh, applications like transport management. This is in Leicester City, and you can see this is vehicle counting and pedestrian counting. Again, you can see the Google map, and you can see the actual movement of these vehicles on the street and doing the counting for traffic management application. And again here, the counting includes pedestrian and uh, uh, cyclist and uh, buses and vehicles. And at the same time, again, you can see from, or actually all this information are sent to the control uh, center where it are analyzed and used for, control, for traffic management. What we have done as well, we have done a project in Birmingham city center, and this is called Parklet. I'm going to let you just listen to this BBC short video. Now, they say small is beautiful, but can the same be applied to a pub public park? A parklet, in other words, a tiny park, has been installed on the street in Birmingham, on the site of a parking loading bay. Here's our environment correspondent, David Gregory Kumar. The south side area of Birmingham is home to the Chinese quarter in the city's gay village. And now what was a loading bay on a side street is the city's first parklet. Why is because we're right in the centre of Birmingham here in the south side district. And in south side there are actually no parks or open spaces. So really the only open space for people who live or work in Southside is on the street. But most of the streets in Southside are quite grey places. So this idea was to make a bit of green on the streets where people can come and sit and enjoy the area. 
lo local opinion on the new arrival is mixed. So people maybe enjoy, and they will sit here, and they will see our shop, and they can come inside. What's it actually going to benefit the area by? How is it going to benefit the area? That's the question I ask. Walking through the parklet, you notice the lovely, the lovely greenery, of course, but there's quite a lot of technology here. For example, there's a large interactive display board thingy here, but the whole area is also being monitored for football. To see if more people visit the street, now the parklet is here. If this one does prove popular, parklets might pop up all over... Yeah, so as you can see, actually, we installed our cameras there. You can see the stuff child logo, of course. And our cameras were installed there doing the counting and the analysis of the efficiency of this parklet. And this, this has been actually done with, uh, in collaboration with the Future Cities Catapult here in the UK and City Centre Borough Council. So when it comes to PG supervision, I was really lucky to start my, uh, as a principal supervisor since I, I finished my PhD. And this was in 2010. And uh, I, since then, I actually, uh, Professor Hajj mentioned seven, but actually this is an old information as there are eight now. One just finished two days ago. So my, my, uh, my student just finished actually the day before yesterday, Christos, and got his PhD. And I actually managed to supervise eight PhD students to successful completion as principal supervisor. Five as second supervisor. At the moment, I'm actually supervising five of them as principal and six as uh, second supervisor. So I was really lucky to work with PhD students and to pass my experience and all the good practice I learned from my supervisors. And uh, based on that, some of these projects, of course, they are, they are not related to what I have been doing in my research uh, in, in different areas, and not directly related to image processing. And others, they have been actual completion and continuation of what I have been doing myself in my PhD. So this example for this using again the physics-based image formation models for autonomous vehicle, and this is for depth estimation. Yeah, so this is Fubara, and he's about to finish. And this is actually it's another one, physics-informed inspired image enhancement. And this is mainly for uh, using the image formation models again, the same model used but for image enhancement, and this is to be used for number of, of application. And you can see here it is actually merging both retinal inspired and image formation models together. And this is, Eng was actually doing this project. And as you can see here, for example, some details which are not seen from the, uh, from the image to the left, the image formation models and the retinal inspired one managed to clarify these details and the same for other applications. The other thing, which is actually, this was my first supervision, Ahmed al Ubaidi from Iraq. And uh, Ahmed actually was uh, investigating the uh, application of biologically inspired machine learning models to what we call it object classification. And instead of using one image to classify this, the object, we have been using number of frames. So a tiny movement of the, of the actual object itself, about 20 frames, and then based on the actual image and the movement of this image, the tiny movement, we have been detecting this one. And the reason? of selecting this approach that the, we found, got found, findings from neuroscience that the human brain has got two parts. So one part which is the dorsal stream and the other part is called ventral stream. And the dorsal stream, which is, of course, you can see it here, the top one is the dorsal stream and the bottom one is the ventral stream from the human visual cortex, which is at the back of our head. And actually the neuroscientists, they have been telling us that this dorsal stream is responsible of tracking of movements, and the ventral stream is about detecting and or classifying the objects from the human visual point of view. So we found out, or the actual neuroscience, they found out that there, is, there are links between the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. And we investigated this one ourselves further by getting this tiny movement of the object and passing it to the object classification. So fusing these together, in a model which is called HMAX model. And this allowed us to actually trying to mimic, let's say, the visual cortex itself. So we started by from the retina to what we call it LGN, and then we started the V1 area. And this V1 area is responsible for what we call it visual mapping. And in reality, this is very, very similar to what the image formation models I have been using in my PhD is doing. And then V2, which is the color constancy, and then 
with the actual model which we have been actually building, computational modeling for this ventral stream and dorsal stream and getting information from the dorsal stream, computational model of course, to the ventral stream and found we managed to get improvement over the object classification one. And this was the model which is what we call it hierarchical uh, model and X or H max model. Actually, as I mentioned, I, I supervised lots of other projects, uh, some of them related to the application of machine learning in cybersecurity, others in smart uh, systems in general, and uh, uh, lots of others, but I just picked on some of them related to computer vision for today. In terms of teaching, I have been teaching since uh, graduation, since 1996, continuously for 26 or plus now. And uh, uh, I was really uh, uh, lucky to be here at Safshan University for 20 years teaching from the first day, from the first year I joined. So I joined March and I started teaching from, from December. I remember at this time, we lost one of our lecturers and uh, they asked me to take uh, responsibilities of two modules as a module leader. And I started in December uh, my teaching and I used to have an average teaching of 12 hours per week. The normal uh, uh, load here is about 18 hours per week. Normally you got some some admin work and stuff. So normally you teach around 14 or so, so 12 hours per week kind of, kind of full load. So, uh, so I was lucky really to start teaching digital and analog electronics and the like. And uh, when I got my full-time job here at Staffordshire University, uh, as a lecturer, I joined the computer network and security team. And I was really, really lucky to do so because the team, and which is still there, Justin Champion, Caroline Bauer, and uh, Chris, uh, uh, Chris Howard, and I don't want to forget actually, of course, uh, uh, Russell Campion and the team is, is amazing. I, 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 I don't think I can find the same team, any, uh, team anywhere else. And I'm still enjoying actually working with them. And I started teaching with computer network and security till now, and now more around the cybersecurity and digital forensic side of things. And I was lucky to be the first one from Staffordshire University to go to ECAM in France. So, and it happened again in China. I was the first one to go to China for a reason or another. Although these teachings, they, be, they were actually part of the teaching load for engineering, not computing. But for a reason or another, the engineering department asked me to go there because it was embedded systems, which was my kind of uh, uh, expertise. So I was really lucky again to hand over to Professor Abdul Hamid Suleiman. So I went myself and just the second, the after two weeks teaching, so uh, Professor Abdul Hamid was starting teaching again. And of course, still now, Professor Abdul Hamid is actually responsible for the whole collaboration. And I enjoyed being, being actually going to China every year for four or five years until COVID and then doing this one uh, online. And it was a very, very good experience. And in terms of China, of course, I got uh, owner uh, professorship there and it was really, uh, uh, I've done some research with them. Lots of activity has been going there with them. Uh, as aside to the teaching as well, we, I have been actually acting as, a, as a internal examiner and I remember, of course, lots of travels with Aldo's, and uh, I really enjoyed the time there in, in Malaysia, uh, in APU, and we have been traveling again two, three times a year, and it was really lovely time again, and uh, uh, it was actually with Torfe and with lots of colleagues there, so it was really, really good. I work as well as a university ambassador, so we used to go to the Gulf area to represent the university there, so going to schools and, uh, and meeting uh, with uh, recruitment agencies and the like. So with again, Professor Abdul Hamid Suleiman and other colleagues. I, I gave lots of keynote speakers, just picked on two of them. One of them was an Oman invitation from the Ministry of Education. And one of them was a big data expo in China invitation from this one. And this one, of course, those thousands of attendees there on top of IBM and lots of other uh, uh, organizations. I managed to win uh, two Erasmus Plus projects in 2019, 2018, each one of them lasted for two years. And uh, it was really lovely experience. I managed to build a consortium, uh, leading actually this consortium because as, as part, at this time used to be part of the EU. So we had to lead ourselves. So that my consortium included actually five countries. So Lebanon, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco. And uh, we managed to build uh, uh, actually uh, um, seven universities over these countries. Uh, so I got, we got visitors, member of staff and students from Tunisia, this group, for example. We got uh, Justin and Caroline, for example, and this group from Egypt. And we got others from here, for example, from Tunisia, member of staff, from Morocco students, from Egypt students. So it was really good time. And this was about 600 plus uh, 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 thousand euros. So we managed to travel to these countries and we managed to come 
and we managed to build, as, uh, this is again in our lab, this is by the way our AI and IoT lab. Yeah, so uh, uh, we again moved from Morocco, this is in Morocco itself, Mandopolis University, and so on. Part of this one, we managed to build what we call a smart campus demonstrator, and which is actually an effort, combined effort between all these students from all these universities. And in this one, we have been trying to get sensors from our Beacon building, which was new at this time, five years ago, and to apply our analytic solutions to detect the changes or to detect, or, or to, uh, detect events or anomalies, as we call them, and to predict some trends. And based on that, we built a dashboard which allowed us actually to help for the management of these buildings in terms of efficiency management and car park spacing and computer network security and so on. I think I spend a lot of time just about myself, but let's just go to the main topic itself, how to live peacefully with intelligent machines. So the, whenever it comes to intelligent machines, uh, there are lots of challenges, actually. And one of these challenges, which you might not aware of, is the power consumption of these uh, intelligent machines. So yeah, if you consider that we have a, 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 an autonomous vehicle, and if, if you put this autonomous vehicle or, or this vehicle to an autopilot to allow this AI to do the driving for you, this directly exceeds the consumption by 30%. And actually, just to train these models, this actually a lot, a lot of power. And uh, the data centers, for example, these are researchers from IAT, MIT. They found out that the energy used to train or for the data centers, they are actually the same as the energy consumed by a country like Argentina, for example. And you will find that uh, ChatGPT, for example, and similar uh, AI solutions, in order for them to be trained, they have already consumed a lot of power. And every time you call this one, you consume a lot of power. And the issue here is that researchers, they are not really concerned about this power consumption. They are concerned about more efficient AI algorithms and their application and the like. So it is really one of the main challenges to live peacefully with this AI techniques is to be aware of the, 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 the impact of this AI on the environment itself. And as we're gonna try now to understand how this work. And there is something called the hype cycle where you, there are the prediction of about these technologies in the next five to 10 years. And as you can see for 2022, that the prediction gonna be mainly about what we call a generative AI. And this generative AI like the chat GPT and like generative AI for coding, so automatic coding, and lots of application which allows the AI to generate new knowledge and to generate new uh, applications by itself instead of just targeting certain applications. So you will find that AI managed to perform in the last 10, 15 years because of a number of things. First of all, because of the advancement in uh, research. The other thing, because of the more powerful devices. And the next one is because of the cheap computational power, and finally because of the availability of lots of data. And all these machine learning models are data hungry. They need lots, lots of data. Hence, we need to understand a little bit more about how they work and what, 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 what is this AI we are talking about. AI is actually the umbrella of a number of things. Underneath this umbrella, there are robotics, machine learning, and others. So whenever we talk about these techniques, we mainly talk about machine learning techniques. And what we are talking about nowadays is under this um umbrella of machine learning is called ANN, or artificial neural networks. And the one which is actually, the, they are now applied commercially, and they're proven successful commercially, they are the deep learning models. So it is really important to understand what is AI and what, what is uh, deep learning as we actually refer to today. And actually, before 2010, everyone was losing uh, confidence in the application of neural networks. Because there was, no, there was lots of hopes, of course, before 2000 and 1990, 1980s, about neural networks and how they can form and how they can change the world. But what happened that before 2010, the, this uh, uh, actual, uh, it, uh, everyone lost confidence that any commercial application or practical application could emerge out of it. But 2010, when Google started deep learning and they added more layers to the neural network and they found out that there are lots of practical applications like the ones we are seeing now and we're actually using nowadays, like face recognition, image 
understanding, natural language processing, of course, and autonomous vehicle and the like. This all this started from 2010 till now. And what we are trying to do as researchers, we are trying to get data and to convert this data using the machine learning models into information and this information into knowledge and hopefully this knowledge into wisdom. So the first thing we do, we apply the machine learning model on the data itself to get some information. And based on the additional layers we have been adding to these neural networks, we can try to convert this information into knowledge. And what the researchers are trying to do now, and the research community, trying to convert this one into wisdom as much as possible by increasing and adding more layers and adding more data to them as well. So to the left is a simple neural network, which as I mentioned, everyone was losing faith on it uh, at the time of 2010. And then after that, after they start increasing the depth of these layers and adding more hidden layers, as you can see from the right, which is what we call it deep learning models. And this is what we are using at the moment and this is what made the difference itself. So in machine learning, before deep learning, which is the top one, we used to, as researchers, we used to get some features from the, for assuming computer vision now, some features from the object itself, and we, we do it in, in, in a manual way. We call it handcraft features, which means we, for example, some of the researchers, they decide to go for edges, others they decide to go for colors, others they try to go for texture, and so on. And combinations, and then they try to introduce this one to neural network or a machine learning model, hoping, hoping that you can get good classification, for example. But what happened with the deep neural network, after adding more hidden layers, we, we don't need anymore to do this handcraft feature extraction. We can throw all the data as is to the neural network itself, and the deep neural network can actually do two things. They can do the feature extraction for us and the classification at the same time, which made a huge difference. Because before that, it used to be the case that every time you need to select the, a feature or a set of features, and you are not sure which feature or set of feature gonna be gonna be the best one. But with deep learning, it is now automated process. So the model itself is actually getting these features for you. And this is what made the difference between neural networks and between deep learning. So, and this is actually just the artificial intelligence between 1950, as we said, to 1980s, and machine learning started around 1980s to 2006 or so, from 2010, which is neural networks mainly, and then from 2010 up till now, the advancement using these deep neural networks. The main functionalities for these ones are anomaly detection, classification, regression, and clustering. So if you want broad terms, what are the main applications of machine learning? And in more specifics, gonna be something like this one. Gonna be either supervised or, or unsupervised or reinforcement learning. So supervised, where you got the data, and you can manually label this data yourself and then pass it to the model and then teach the model that if you got this input, then this should be the class, for example, if classification. And then based on that, the model will learn and based on that, when you introduce new data, hopefully it will be able to tell you which one, which class this input was. Unsupervised learning without labeling the data, you just throw everything and this is try to do some clustering or it could do dimensionality reduction or number of other things for us. Reinforcement learning, where you have you yourself and the machine learning trying to talk to each other. So you, you let the machine learning do some task and then you intervene by saying this is correct thing or this is a wrong thing. And based on that, the machine learning will learn from the reward and punishment, let's say. And this mainly used for computer games and the like. So these are the main things which are used when it comes to machine learning, uh, which is supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement learning. And as I said, for the supervised one, you need labels and you need to add lots of training data. And based on that, you choose the model you wanted. And then after that, after you build the model, then you can introduce new data and then allow this new data to, be, uh, 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 to go through the model and then for the model to do whatever prediction, classification or other things. So when it comes to computer vision in my field, when it comes to object classification, we introduced lots of classes, so data set or database like this one, where you got lots of images for airplane, lots of images for birds, and so on, and you, you label it. Label this image is a bird, 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 and pass it to the model. This car, car, and so on, pass to the model, and then let the model learn as deep learning model, and then based on that, whenever you introduce a new image, this will, will show whether it is actually this class or the other class. So this is how 
object classification is working. And based on that, we can get to this real-time classification of objects and detection of this one with some confidence level. Yeah, so do you think is it uh, efficient or not? In the case, it is really efficient. And uh, before deep learning, it was less than the performance of human being. But with deep learning now, it is actually exceeding the performance of human being. As you can see, it is a curve here. For deep learning, it is exceeding the human level performance, which is a dotted line, as you can see. So it can detect more classes and subclasses even than a human being. I'm going to finish now with just giving you some examples of projects which currently I am leading. One of them is what we call it uh, a knowledge transfer partnership with a company in Stafford called Connexia, Connexica, data analytic company. And actually, this is one of the things I, I want to refer to when it comes to AI and the challenges of AI and how to live peacefully with AI. One of the main things is traditional machine learning models, they are white boxes, which means that we can understand how they work. After the model is built, we can actually understand what are the logic of the model itself. But new models, which deep learning models, they are black boxes which means that we don't know how the model came with this decision. So based on that, we, we cannot justify it, we cannot explain it, we cannot interpret it. So for an application like, for example, medicine, this is not useful because this is not going to be a commercial product because you need to explain to the patient, for example, that you, got, you have these symptoms and then based on that, you have such and such and such, but just telling them that this is what you got without any explanation, this doesn't work. The same applies for when you want to give mortgage decision, for example, or financial decision. It needs to be justified, needs to be interpreted. Hence, for this project, what we are doing here is, is uh, developing techniques called XAI, explainable AI. And this explainable AI to turn the deep learning models from black boxes into white boxes. And this is what we are trying to do. So as you can see, normal machine learning models, you can understand the rules directly. But for deep learning models, you need an XAI technique. And then based on the XAI, you can come up with a set of rules which you can understand or explain the model itself, which is turns application of deep learning in lots of sectors being commercially acceptable. So this is what we have been doing. Connexica is a data analytic company, Stafford, as I mentioned. They have already their own analytics tools, but they don't have explanation ones, they don't have XAI ones. So we are helping them in terms of building XAI to a tool for them to allow them to provide to three sectors. They got their customers are from finance, retail, and health. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to, on top of their model, they got, for example, here the uh, actual machine learning models and their traditional or conventional machine learning models, by nature, they are, black, they are white boxes. So they don't need explanation. The part of their output is an actually set of rules. But when it comes to the sophisticated AI models, deep learning models, they are black boxes. So what we need to do is, we need, so they are not transparent, they are not inter inter uh, interpretable, they are not trusted, and they cannot be used in commercial application. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to introduce XAI techniques, explainable AI techniques on top of these deep learning models to explain the output of these deep learning models. And this is what we are building at the moment. We started last August. We got this, of course, 170K from the uh, uh, Innovate UK. And this is what we are trying to achieve by the end of uh, uh, this project. The last thing I'm going to mention is about nature first which is a European Commission project, Horizon Europe project. It is a 4.9 million project, 11 partners, three universities, the only university from the UK is Staffordshire University, and two other universities from Netherlands and Spain, and the other eight companies from, again, Europe. And uh, myself as a co-investigator for this one with my colleague, uh, Claire Gwanet, and my colleague, the principal, Claire is the principal investigator for this one. Nature First is mainly for nature uh, conservation. So what we are trying to do is trying in a forensic way, we are trying to monitor what's happening in four wildlife sites in Europe. So one of them in Spain, one in Ukraine, and one in uh, Romania, and one in between uh, uh, Spain and uh, Romania, I believe. So there are four of them. 
And one of the actual partners uh, is South Africa, but they are not, we are not going to apply our technologies in South African one, but the South African wildlife side, they got very good tools. So they're actually giving, providing training to our wildlife sites in Europe. And what we are doing is building what we call a digital twin. Digital twin, which is the forensic scientist here at Staffordshire University, my colleague, for example, and from other universities, they are building a model for this wildlife site. And we, as computer uh, vision scientists, we are trying to monitor what's going on using camera traps and then to classifying the animals and the species and detecting them and counting them and checking what's going on inside the uh, wildlife site. And based on that, trying to build the forensic evidence if there, is, there are any illegal activities. So this is what we are doing and we are building digital twin as part of, of this model. As I mentioned, getting uh, for our side, for our part of the work, getting data from camera traps and doing the uh, classification and counting and providing this information to the virtual, to the physical actual model of the digital twin itself. Finally, the, this was a, a project which is with uh, uh, Stoke Council where we have been proposing SUPA, which is Smart Urban Planning Analytics. And this was a smart uh, city uh, solution where we try to collect data from CCTV control center, from uh, citizen uh, application, and from uh, real-time data, and trying to do the analytics on top of this one to help four sectors, so uh, to help the transport, the uh, uh, community well-being, the safety, public safety, and the uh, environment, because they used to have different sensors, each one of them, but they are not talking to each other as departments. So we wanted to combine this in analytic platform to allow this analysis to be done and to be shared between departments. We applied in conjunction with Stoke City Council, but we did not get the fund for this one. It was about two million uh, worth of money. But I want to just to mention this one as one sort of trying again to improve uh, Stoke City. And this was in collaboration with five different uh, uh, companies. So I'm going to end with this one. So we need to think big and we need to think fast as well because these intelligent machines, they are not coming. They're actually living with us now. So all what we mentioned about this power consumption and about the, the interpretation of the models is going to be our role as computer scientists and machine learning researchers to find solutions and to take into consideration and to build good machines which we can help us and don't, does not contradict with us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Um, when we think about the video analytics and image analytics work that you've done, is the opportunity to use AI now to detect the creations of other AI? I'm thinking, you know, about um, artistic works and detecting when they've been made by AI. Yeah, this is actually, as we, you might have seen from Gartner uh, Hype Cycle, you'll find that actually the majority of the work now in AI is about generative AI. So you will find, yes, uh, this is really the new trend, let's say, and this is what, gonna be ex what we're expecting during the, for the next few years. To be, you can, it is actually still in the first part of the cycle, but it is actually most likely in a year or two this is going to go to the top, which means this commercial application will appear very, very soon. And it is nowadays you can see some of this evidence of having this from the computer vision, from real world, to generate artificial kind of creation for these uh, uh, videos or imagery or audio and the like. So this is really the very, very hot topic area nowadays, and this is a, the very new future one which is going to be booming yeah, as commercial applications. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mohammed. It was a very, very nice presentation. Thank you. I'm privileged to be here. Thank you. In fact, I have two questions, uh, both which are unrelated. The first one is, I think the, uh, the chat GPT is the, seems to be the rage these days, whether you have any view on the use of chat GPT for education. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, have you, do you have, have you done any work in the application to agriculture? Those are the two questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course, ChatGPT actually uh, is a uh, breakthrough in terms of uh, allowing lots of things, but at the same time, it causes lots of challenges as well for us 
in the education system and in lots of other systems. So uh, it is, although it is actually doing very good job, but it should be used in the right way again. And this is again partly, uh, as we, we talked about things which might not really uh, of consideration of lots of people, which is the power consumption and whether this chat GPT will be really efficient in terms of uh, practical solution to replace, for example, uh, 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 workers and the like or not. But what is, uh, happens at the end, chat GPT can, could be very, very useful, but at the same time, it might hinder the uh, potential of loss of jobs and loss of uh, 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 work. So in a way, it needs to be used in a wise way. But for sure, the future will actually will present much more applications sim similar to ChatGPT. Just one, so one thing I want to mention about ChatGPT is when you choose the application, AI application, you need to consider as well the power consumption of it. So ChatGPT has got lots of other alternatives. And majority of them actually, they consume less power than ChatGPT. I, I know for the normal users, it is not of real interest, but for the community and for the environment, we're gonna make a huge difference by selecting the right technology for the right application. I, my, regarding the second question for the agriculture, actually, we at the moment we are, I, I have not worked before in the agriculture area or, or sector, but uh, we started a project just two weeks ago. Just, there was a meeting just yesterday about it, and we are trying to, yeah, to build kind of smart farm, kind of digital twin again. So uh, this is with, with another university here in the UK. So this, to be honest, this is my first time for this uh, kind of uh, research in this sector, yeah. All right. Can I say well done? Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Yeah, thanks. And then uh, my question is, can you share some of the challenges which you had to do with uh, using ImageNet if you're using it? Yeah. Yeah, of course, the, as we said, these deep learning models, especially, they are hungry for data hungry. So they use a lot, a lot of data. And whenever you got a data set, public domain data set like ImageNet, for example, so you'll find all sorts of images there. And for you as a researcher, you need to refine them. And you need to make sure that you use the right ones. The, the, one of the main challenges for, in my case, for video surveillance application, the industry, and actually the same applies to this nature first project, for example, what we're gonna use uh, images from camera traps. This image net, for example, is not representative of some of these field of use of these camera traps and these surveillance cameras. So the camera traps, when they put them in the wildlife sites, they put them in different settings, which normally they capture images different than the normal images which is people they get it, which is a majority of image net, for example, uh, 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 images they got. So the main issue and the main challenge I face myself is the camera, uh, what we call it, field of view, and the angle, so the camera positioning. And hence, most of the time, we start by training the model using image net, but when we, when we actually apply the model, we use what we call it transfer learning. So we had to get images from the scene itself, from the actual setting of the inst camera, installed camera, and then do transfer learning, which is improving the model using this extra imagery. So this is the main thing which I'm facing in lots of projects, including, for example, when it comes to uh, smart car park monitoring here, for example, or the, as we mentioned, the Nature Ferris project. Thank you. Two more short questions and two short answers, please. So over yeah. there, please. Um, uh, Professor, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, very interesting to hear about your journey and all the good work you have been doing. Uh, you nicely, uh, you know, compared and uh, distinguished between the traditional machine learning approaches versus deep learning approaches. Uh, I mean, machine learning ones, of course, are driven by mathematical models, so they are explainable. And the challenge with the deep learning, as you rightly said, is they work, but we don't know why they work. So you mentioned about the explainable AI and uh, something you are investigating. So. Would you like to elaborate a bit more? Uh, I mean, what sort of strategies you are adopting in order to as explain and uh, I mean, um, I mean, describe why they work? So, quite quite curious to hear about that. Thank yeah, you. sure. Yeah. Do, do so, you, do you, do you mind, this is quite yeah. a difficult question, I think. Yeah. Do you mind if this is taken outside this room, just to because um, we have to finish? Do you mind? Is all right. Yeah. What one final question, please, for me? Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. And thank you. I mean, it's clear from your description of your journey that we're in the presence of greatness. And thank you. it's, um, you know, and I know you're a really humble person. So thank you. It's, um, it, was, it was a real pleasure to, 
to actually listen to this. Uh, my question was really about um, clearly the applications of some of your work are really expanding enormously now, especially with AI coming on board. And I'm just wondering where, you know, in the future of the next four or five years, are you going to be still focusing on visual imaging or are you going to be expanding further into other applications of AI? Yeah, actually, good question because actually this is what I have been doing for the last uh, seven, eight years. So I mentioned about a number of projects which are related to computer vision, but in fact, the majority of the projects I'm leading now, they are not related to computer vision directly, the application for uh, machine learning in general, for lots of applications. And as, you, as I mentioned about my teaching, is mainly now, actually not now, since 2010, about the computer network and security. So I'm focusing more into the application of machine learning in cybersecurity. And both of them, as I've been talking with Dr. Taher uh, just two days ago, so those are actually, these are top, hot, very, very uh, topical kind of uh, uh, research areas, uh, cybersecurity and machine learning. So um, in reality, I have been applying machine learning models for smart systems for a number of years now, other than computer vision and for cybersecurity. And this is going to be my focus for the next few years. But the initial first project, of course, came across it. So I couldn't resist it, which is actually a computer vision one. But the majority of the others, like the uh, Connexica one, for example, this is an XAI, this is a machine learning platform, generic one, to be used by businesses. So mainly actually focusing in general use of machine learning to a number of different applications. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Thank you. Okay. And uh, please join me all to congratulate Mohammed. Yeah. OK. Obviously, you can, you can still grab yeah. Mohammed okay. outside. Thanks a lot. You want yeah. to have questions? Thank you all.